Good, good morning, church family. Uh, please join me as we prepare for this morning's service. Um, we're going to sing There is a Redeemer. Can be found on page 358 in your song books. are encouraged to attend as we reflect on God's goodness to us over the past year. It's also an opportunity to hear firsthand about the operation of your church. So a light luncheon will be served and please bring along your copy of the annual report for review. Thank you. This Saturday, March the 2nd at 1 p.m., we will be hosting the annual World Day of Prayer service. This uplifting service has been prepared by the Christian woman in Palestine. So please see the insert in your bulletin this morning and pass it along to someone to join you. A time of fellowship will be held after the service. Due to your generosity, a large amount of food will be delivered to the local food bank on Tuesday to support those less fortunate in our neighborhood. So the donations will be dedicated to God's glory this morning. And thank you for helping to make a difference in someone's life. These are all the announcements. Thank you, Joyce. What a, what a beautiful day it is. The sun is shining outside. It's not too cold. It's a good day to praise God's name. If you're able, stand loud. Let's sing holy, holy, holy.
O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's love is poured into our hearts. Please be seated. And Sophia, you come on up, sweet man. Sophia will lead us in our second re uh, Lent reading from PWSMD. number 422, sing a new song unto the Lord. come to you as our Lord and as our God because we're in awe of you and we worship you. We come to you in the name of Jesus because you've promised to be with us when we gather together in his name. So bless us, God, in this time of worship. 
with a reverent and joyful sense of your presence, that we may be at peace and can worship you with all our minds and bodies and spirits through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Apostle John says in his first letter, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. And He is the atoning sacrifice for all our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In the strength of this assurance, let's confess our sins to God using the prayer in our bulletin. Father in heaven, your love brings life to dead souls, light to darkened minds, strength to weak wills. Help us to believe and trust that no wrong we have done, no good we have failed to do, is too great for you to forgive. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Hear the good news. The scriptures say, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through him. That means in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And since God has forgiven us in Christ, let's all live this week in peace and harmony with one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Now turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself or say hello in Jesus' name. Sunday of February, we have been singing songs of special significance during Black History Month to of African American spirituals, and we're going to sing now 571, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Sing it with all our hearts.
Sunday school and they're going to be singing some special music for us. I've got Peace Like a River and Sophia, I understand you're going to be playing this song, so come on up and children, come on up and let's sing together. to 52. It can be found on page 48 in the Pew Bibles and page 1582 in the large print Bibles. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and the large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly. 
Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, friends, we have special music led by Raiden Osik and your instructed congregation. We're going to be singing the verses and the final chorus. So follow me if you want to know what to say.
crossed over the Jordan River to come back into the nation of Israel when they were away. But did you notice in the text, it says that as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, kind of going back out of town, they weren't alone. They were, quote, together with a large crowd leaving the city. Now, why does Mark tell us that? Why would there be a large crowd? Well, Jericho was on the pilgrim route up to Jerusalem, up to the temple. And from what we know in the very next chapter, just after the verses we read today, the Passover festival was approaching. So in all likelihood, this was a crowd of Jewish pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Every male over 12 years of age who lived within a couple of days walk to the city of Jerusalem was expected to be there. And many families from across Israel and from even farther away um, tried to make this pilgrimage on a regular basis to celebrate that wonderful moment when God redeemed and saved his people Israel from their slavery in the land of Egypt and gave them his law and he became their God and he promised to them a land and a future. And the fact that there's this large crowd making their way up to Jerusalem for the festival that was approaching probably explains the fact of a man named Bartimaeus sitting on the side of the road begging. Has this ever happened to you? You stop at a traffic light on one of the busy streets downtown or maybe just inside or outside the doors of one of the TTC subway stations or walking past a coffee shop or a fast food place and you encounter a beggar with a sign a panhandler asking for money and the signs they hold up well they typically convey a message like homeless and hungry please help thank you and God bless you know what I'm talking about now people have mixed emotions about offering donations some people some people happily reach into their pockets or their purses and hand these folks spare chains change um, others, they roll up their windows in the car and lock the doors in fear of their safety. What do you do? Some of us just sort of look the other way. Every time I, I read this story of, of, about blind Bartimaeus, I think of those folk and vice versa. I see them and I think of this story. A man named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road begging too on this pilgrim route up to Jerusalem. So it must have been a pretty good place for him to beg from spiritually minded travelers on their way to worship God. And Bartimaeus, of course, what was his ailment? What was his condition? He was blind. There was no CNIB in the first century world. There's no social assistance from the government. And that meant blindness always meant poverty. Bartimaeus was both blind and he was poor. He lacked both sight and resources. Sitting beside the road, he was literally sidelined and marginalized an outsider and bystander on the road of life. According to Luke's version of this story, Luke also tells us this story about Bartimaeus. When Bartimaeus heard all the commotion going on in front of his particular begging spot, he asked what was going on. What's happening, he says. And somebody in the crowd told him that Jesus of Nazareth was in the neighborhood passing through. Apparently, Bartimaeus had heard of this man, Jesus, so he calls out, hoping this man could relieve him, perhaps of his poverty, maybe even of the darkness. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. 
I'm going to just stop there, friends. Here is the first lesson I want us to learn about being a Christian. You know, to follow Jesus, to be one of his disciples, means that however much we may know about certain matters, however much expertise we think we have in certain fields, when it comes to the most basic issue of our relationship with God, we're blind. We're poor. We stand in need of God's mercy. That's what the Bible teaches us, and that's what our own experience teaches us, if we're honest enough to admit it. We need help. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. That's how we come to God. Lost, blind, distracted, in need of God's saving help. And Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus in the best way he knows how. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now he doesn't have a full understanding of who Jesus really is. He doesn't call out son of God or Emmanuel or Lord or Savior. He uses this phrase, son of David, which was a title used for the Messiah in the Old Testament, the one God would be sending to rescue his people. Ever since the Old Testament promise in 2 Samuel 7 that God would raise up an offspring from the lineage of King David and establish the throne of his kingdom forever, faithful Jewish people had been waiting and longing for a descendant of David to come to be, the, to be their Messiah. And somehow, despite his blindness, in his desperation, he trusts, he knows that Jesus is God's Messiah. This unique man sent from God to liberate the oppressed and vindicate the victimized, maybe even grant sight to the blind, as long ago Isaiah had prophesied the Messiah would do. He hadn't yet grasped that this Messiah, Jesus, would also be Emmanuel, God with us, the very incarnate Son of God. He didn't quite get that yet. Of course, the disciples hadn't yet grasped that either. But Bartimaeus simply cries out in faith, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, help me. And I hope that's encouraging to you. Because being a follower of Jesus doesn't start once you've passed the approved Bible content examination. Doesn't begin when you've reached a certain level of spiritual maturity. No, Christian faith begins with one simple step. When we recognize the confusion or the poverty or the need in our lives, and we ask God for help. Discipleship begins long before we can hang all the correct theological labels on Jesus, often a long time before. As my friend Victor Shepherd, who teaches up at Tyndale Seminary once wrote, discipleship in truth is much simpler than most people imagine. It's simpler because the slightest admission of our need and of Christ's availability will render us disciples in the making. I have a need, Lord help, we're on the road. But as soon as blind Bartimaeus cries out, Jesus help, some folk in the crowd tell him to pipe down. Verse 48 tells us many of the people scolded him and told him to be quiet. Now why do you think they did that? Why did they try to shut Bartimaeus up? He was just asking for help. Here he is shouting out for help and people start to rebuke him and tell him to be quiet. But Bartimaeus, what does he do? 
He just cranks up the volume and he repeats his appeal to Jesus even louder. Maybe, maybe some people in the crowd are anxious for Jesus. They want to prevent the trouble that Jesus might get into if the authorities overhear these messianic acclamations calling him things like Son of David. Remember, Jesus has been in severe and growing conflict with the religious leaders, and they're looking for any excuse to put him away and to do away with his ministry, as of course, what will very soon happen. Or maybe, maybe they're simply people who are embarrassed by this blind beggar's unruly behavior. Aren't some of us guilty of the same thing? In the presence of someone with a profound disability? Some people can feel uncomfortable or awkward around them. They don't know what to say, what to do, what, how to respond. So it's better that they're just not seen or heard from to make it easier on us and keep things in control. But thank goodness God does not judge people like so many of us do. As the verse of scripture puts it, human beings often focus on another person's outward appearance. But where does God see? God sees the heart. God looks inside. God looks at a person's genuine intent. And because the heart of God always responds to a sincere cry for mercy and help. The text says, in the midst of all this crowd, all the noise, all the rush, Jesus on his way to, to Jerusalem, it says Jesus stopped. That's what it says in verse 49. The original Greek literally means, and Jesus stood still. It's like, how remarkable it is that the Son of God allows the cries of a poor, powerless person to stop him in his tracks. Isn't it? Jesus stopped in order that the man be brought to him. And then the people in the crowd saw Jesus stop in his tracks to meet Bartimaeus. And so they cry out, hey, it's your lucky day. Get up. He's calling for you. Mark includes some fascinating details of this encounter in verse 50. It says, throwing his cloak aside, he jumped up to his feet and came to Jesus. Now that cloak he threw aside was his outer garment, an outer robe that the ancient Jewish people would wear over their inner nightshirt-like garment. It was the only covering that many poor people had which is why the Old Testament, one of the laws in the Old Testament was that you could never confiscate or take away that garment from anyone because that was literally could mean the, their protection at night between life and death. Apparently he had been using his cloak spread out on the ground in front of him to collect donations of pocket chains and coins and food offerings from the passing crowds on their way to Jerusalem. But the fact that, that Bartimaeus can toss his, his cloak aside and spring to his feet at once makes you sense how eager he was to get to Jesus. But it also implies something else, I think. Because if his occupation was begging and generous people were putting their donations on his cloak, then tossing aside that cloak represents leaving behind the symbol of his occupation. Just like James and John left behind their fishing nets to follow Jesus. Just like Matthew got up from the tax collector's booth and left it behind to follow Jesus. Maybe that's what Bartimaeus is wanting to show us too. And it's ironic, isn't it, that this poor man who had next to nothing in this world finds it easier to follow Jesus than the man who had many possessions. Remember last week, the rich young ruler who left away sad, who left Jesus sad.
because he couldn't give it up. So Bartimaeus comes up to Jesus, and what does Jesus ask him? Look at, look at verse 51. It says, here's the question for today, friends. What do you want me to do for you? Now, surely Bartimaeus' need should have been obvious to Jesus. The most practical response would have been for Jesus to heal Bartimaeus quickly and quietly and keep moving because he's got more weighty responsibilities to attend to. But no, Jesus stops and he asks him this question, what do you want me to do for you? Because for Jesus, Bartimaeus is not a problem to be dealt with. He's not an obstacle in the way of his greater mission and purpose. No, in front of him, Bartimaeus is a person to be treated with dignity and respect. A human being made in God's image. And Jesus shows him that respect and dignity by asking Bartimaeus a question giving Bartimaeus his own voice, his own dignity, his own agency, giving Bartimaeus the ability to express himself as a person, to give an answer in his own voice. Rather than treating him as a problem to be dealt with or as a voiceless victim, Jesus asks and listens intently to the man's answer. Teacher, he says, <laughs> I don't want to see again. In humble trust, Bartimaeus doesn't ask for wealth or power or success, but for sight. He's not asking to be superhuman, but merely human. And so Jesus declares, go, your faith has made you well. Jesus healed his blindness on the spot. Can you just imagine that moment? <laughs> What's interesting is the word for healing here, to be made well, is the very same word for Greek in Greek as salvation, sozo, showing us both the physical and spiritual dimension of this miracle. Bartimaeus is healed and he is saved at the same moment. And how appropriate this word is because of what Bartimaeus does next. Verse 52 says, he was able to see and he followed Jesus along the road. Up toward Jerusalem where Jesus was now bound. Here is a picture of a model disciple. In the span of a few moments, Jesus has changed Bartimaeus from a beggar sitting beside the road to a disciple on the road with Jesus. Bartimaeus was a nobody on the road of life who took the initiative to cry out to Jesus in his time of need. He believed Jesus had the power and the authority from God to help, and he asked. And how does Jesus respond? He gives Bartimaeus Dignity and recognition by stopping and listening to his request. He gave him restoration to a productive life by giving him sight. And Jesus gave him a new purpose. To become a follower of Christ on the road of life. Now friends, what does this passage of scripture mean for us today? Maybe for some of us this morning, you feel like Bartimaeus at the beginning of the story. Not physically blind, I mean, but you feel sidelined or insignificant or trapped by your circumstances, a bystander on the road of life, and you're going nowhere fast. Do those words describe how you feel at work or at home or at school right now? Did they, did they describe your health, your career, your marriage, your relationship with God? Let me encourage you to do what Bartimaeus did. Take the initiative. 
Don't let this day pass by before you bow down and cry out to Jesus in humble, trusting faith, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. If you've never asked, if you've never committed your life to Jesus, tell him. Tell him like we were singing about just now a few moments ago. I want to be a Christian. Acknowledge that your sin has separated you from God and that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you. Ask Jesus to be your Savior. And the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And on the authority of God's word, Jesus promises to transform your life just like he did long ago on that Jericho road to recognize you and give you new life and a new purpose for living. What about the rest of us? What does this passage say to us who are already believers? If you're already a Christian, let me ask you something. When you get home from church today, if there was Jesus on the door knocking, and he came in and said, well, hello. And you said, well, hello, Lord. Wasn't expecting to see you today. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say? What do you want me to do for you, Kevin? Now, brothers and sisters, let's not be overly humble at this point. Oh, 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 nothing for me, Lord. I, I'm okay. I'm fine. It may be a sign of our spiritual dullness or even false pride if we aren't able to answer Jesus' question. What do you want me to do for you, says Jesus? If you find it hard to answer that question, it may be a sign that we've been trying to live the Christian life in our own strength or that we've never learned how to trust the Lord for the deep needs and the most important things in our lives that only He can satisfy. Jesus is asking us, He's asking me, what do you want me to do for you? Take some time this week to ponder that question. What part of your life, what relationship, what need, what fear, what opportunity is the Lord asking you to bring to Him? Jesus wants to meet with us and help us with our deepest needs. Will you take the time to answer His question this week? Friends, let's follow the example of Bartimaeus who cried out to Jesus for mercy. Jesus always responds when we ask for help. Bartimaeus asked for his sight and then his eyes were opened. He saw Jesus and began to follow him. Let's ask God during this season of Lent to open our eyes to see Jesus so that we can follow him and grow deeper in our friendship with Him. Amen. Lord, open our eyes to see You more clearly, to love You more dearly, to follow You more nearly, day by day. Amen. We lift up our offerings to the Lord and we dedicate the food bank offerings that we have received this month. Let's stand and sing the doxology.
see, but up at the front there in the basket in front of the communion table is a representative sample of some of the foods that have been given. Let's pray. Generous God, we marvel at your lavish gifts for us, life and breath, food and shelter, opportunities for work and play, and especially freedom and peace in Christ. Just as Jesus once multiplied five loaves and two fish into a beautiful meal for so many, we dedicate, Lord, these gifts including the food that we bring to the food bank, that from our sharing together to others, blessings may flow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take some time to speak to the Lord. Um, two items we heard in our own church family that the Jagdus family had the unexpected loss of Emmanuel's sister. We just had another loss in their family just a short time ago. So Emmanuel, our brother, we pray for you and, and uh, we understand that your wife has gone back home to attend the funeral and you're here with the children. And also we pray for Glenn and Kathy Callan, our newer friends from the former Westview Church, on the sudden death of Glenn's sister. We pray for you today. Let's pray to the Lord. Merciful God, thank you that you are always present with us in all things in all circumstances, each day and each night. Thank you for your gifts of life and friendship. Thank you for the blessings of this new day, and especially on this Youth Sunday, for all the children and young people, and especially those young ones who are most precious to each of us. We offer to you all that we are, all that we have, all we do, all those people that we will encounter this week, that you will be given the glory. We offer to you, Lord, our homes and work, our schools, our free time, our chores, our phone calls, our emails. May all that we do be done as if it were for you. Sovereign Lord of the whole earth, we pray for our broken, hurting world. Bring healing and wholeness to peoples and nations and have pity on those places being torn apart by division or war. Strengthen all who are being persecuted for your name's sake and deliver them from evil, especially Christians in North Korea and Somalia, in Iran and Yemen. Living God, you call us to be good stewards of our earthly home. Strengthen us to care for your creation. Forgive us through our greed or indifference when we abuse its beauty or damage its potential. And empower us by your spirit to so nurture and love the world in our own little corner that all creation will sing to your glory. O oh God, into your hands we place all those who are victims of prejudice or oppression or neglect, those who are feeling frail or unloved, those who feel restless or have given up hope, those who have fallen prey to the powers of evil. Deliver and rescue them with your mighty power. Into your hands, O oh Lord, our shepherd, we place Pastor Fernando's sister, Tanya, in the Spanish church. For Audrey's husband, Martin. For Mary Moira's relatives back in Kenya. For members of Norma's extended family. 
for people in our church congregation who are at home today recovering from surgery or illness. Keep them in your peace and touch them with your healing hand. Into your hands, O Lord, our shepherd, we lift up those who have suffered loss of loved ones this week. For Emmanuel and the whole Jagdus family, as they mourn the unexpected passing of Emmanuel's sister. For Glenn and Kathy Callan on the sudden death of Glenn's sister, Susan. For others known to us, watch over them, Lord, and watch over us this week. Holy Spirit of God, circle us with your presence and your protection this week. Keep faith and courage within and fear out. Keep peace in and strife out. Keep good in and harm out. Keep hope in and despair out. Keep your light in and darkness out. In a moment of silence now, let's commend ourselves and all those for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. And now let us pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. Praying together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The final hymn, Amazing Grace, number 670.
peace, to love and serve the Lord. And remember to hear Jesus when he asks us, what do you want me to do for you? Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.